Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program in which we talk about all things Beatles, the past and the present. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing, being joined by my three regular co-hosts and a special guest to the program. First, we'll introduce the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also, from Beatle Fan Magazine, we have Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. And also from Beatle Fan, we have Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone out there. And we have a special guest, and he was our guest on the last program that we had, and that being Tom Franjone, who uh, wears many hats. Uh, he writes for Beatle Fan. He helps out Joe Johnson with his program called Beatle Brunch. He does a lot of work for the Fest for Beatle Fans, helping Mark Lapitos out. So let's welcome Tom back to the show. Hi, Tom. Hey, Ken. We are back by uh, either popular demand or budgetary uh, limitation, one or the other. <laughs> so it's good to be back. I had a real blast last week and uh, played the show for a couple people who hadn't heard it and and thought they thought it was real good too. So we've got a couple new fans too. Yeah, it was great, great having you on. And uh, the last show that we did was part one <laughs> of our yeah. year in review show. And um, as Steve knows, and all of us knows, especially because Steve is, you know, on a daily basis cranking out the news on the Beatles, there's so much that really happened in between oh. already <laughs> yeah. uh, in the past year. And uh, I guess to a casual fan, they may not be aware of how much happened, but such was the case that we only were able to tackle the Beatles as a group in our last show. We didn't even talk about the solo careers of the Beatles and what happened in the year 2014. So what we're going to do this time out is just that, talk about the solo projects and the solo activities. And so I thought we'd start by talking about, and you just have to randomly pick a Beatle, I suppose, but uh, let's talk about Ringo first of all. And, yes, uh, that, I guess that's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Ringo Starr to you, Ken. <laughs> that's right, to all of us. Yes. And uh, the, the phrase long overdue was invented in part for this reason. You bet. Uh, but um, one of the things that we should talk about is the All-Star Band Tour. And mm -hmm. uh, Ringo went out with his, uh, I guess, it, I think it's his 13th band, but it's the same band that he's had now for uh, the third straight year. And I want to get the impressions from all of you of what you thought of Ringo's tour. So well, I, uh, I actually wanted... consider this, uh, you know, it's like band 12A because the the repertoire or the the artists who brought songs to the table really didn't change. We just uh, we lost Mark Rivera to the Billy Joel residency uh, that mm -hmm. he's doing here in New York at the Garden, and we got a great player Warren Ham in there. He played with Toto and a bunch of the session guys before, so that was kind of a natural entree. But uh, you know. I, I know you guys have had Mark Rivera um, before and have met him at the fest and things like that. And he'll he'll be the first to tell you, Ringo loves this band. He, he mm -hmm. this is one of those weird things we touched on it last week. How sometimes you look at it on paper and you say, "Huh, Todd Rundgren and the guy from Mister Mister, how's that going to work out?" But it just does. Um, this is a really really tight band, and I think one of the, the big secrets to the you know to to the success of it is how they are truly not just going around the horn playing each other's songs, but uh, taking things, the best example I can give are the Santana songs, sung by the original singer, uh, Greg Raleigh. But I don't know about you guys, when I, I think of Santana, I think of a great guitar player with the cape and the hat and everything, and I, those are guitar songs. And it's not just anybody who could step in and do the guitar parts and make those songs sizzle. Having a world-class guitar player, Steve Lukather there, um, to take those. It was like secret sauce. You know, you had the, the original lead vocalist and you had a guy who could do all the heavy lifting on the guitar. Real, real, you know, successful uh, formula. Okay. Who wants to, to uh, add to Tom's comments? I saw him at the Beacon. I thought it was a really fine show. I thought, uh, like Tom said, it's a very strong band. Um, there are people in the band who... I've always liked like Todd Rundgren and uh, people who I don't 
care that much about, don't know their solos, their, their repertory very well. So, you know, I mean, Toto, whatever. It's, you know, that's a little um, sort of outside my normal realm of experience. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, but I enjoyed hearing those songs and I enjoyed seeing this band really kind of cooking on them and, and on Ringo stuff, of course, which is, I guess, mainly you know, why you go. And uh, I think... You know, one of the things that always strikes me when I watch these shows, because they are fundamentally oldie shows and the way they're arranged uh, opens them up to some of the criticism that I've seen in reviews of the shows, which is it's a bunch of old guys coming out and playing their old songs. These are reviews written by much younger people, of course. What I always thought was that, you know, you've got these great guys and you're together for an extended period of time to do this tour, why not add a month and go into the studio and record some new stuff so that you can go out and play the new songs with the band that recorded them? You know, I think, and I think that some collaborations may occur that might not otherwise and might be of particular interest. Uh, And it would give people something completely new to listen to with all of these people. So if you don't care about Mr. Mr. or Toto or or whatever it is, it it, it doesn't matter because the players involved are in on this project and um, and it would be something to hear. Um, That's just my sort of uh, extra uh, critical um, view. As I say, that does happen from time to time. So like on the the last... Uh, round of repeats, the o, uh, I guess the 08 and 2010 tours. So you have Gary Wright on board after way too long a wait. Uh, he comes on board, and then Ringo goes in and does his 2012 album, you know, and Gary is on that, okay? And, you know, even even the players among them, so I don't know, you take Mark Rivera, who obviously is uh, on hiatus for this tour, but is still the musical director. He's still you know, rehearsed them and got them, you know, know, did the repertoire and everything. His album, which we we have to mention at least uh, for, you know, one of the great records that came out in this past year, we featured Ringo on it. So you've got Ringo with one of his all-stars. But that record, if you're a guitar player, um, he's got several all-stars that have come uh, come through the ranks. Nils Lofgren is on there. Certainly Steve Lukather is on there. So you get a little sampling, of, a little bit of that cross-pollination here and there. It's uh, it's unfortunate Mark is not on the tour because uh, any one of the songs from the album, frankly, uh, and especially the one he did with Ringo, would make a great addition to the set list right in the middle where they typically do like the, the band spotlight when Ringo goes off. Uh, any mm-hmm. one of them would have been a great uh, addition and given Mark a chance to, to shine on the, on the vocal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember back when uh, Ringo did his second All Star Band tour. He was asked this very same question: Why don't you get these same guys in a room and mm-hmm. make an album together? And it's not as easy as it sounds because most of these musicians, their life is on the road, so sure. that's their paycheck. You know, they may not be making as much money as they once did with their recordings, but many of them tour on a regular basis. And Tom yeah. Rungman, I can certainly speak for. He he tours all the time, every single oh, yeah. year. So it just means that you have to find a window when everyone is available, and it's not as easy as it sounds. So uh, like Tom was saying, the, you know, the, the benefit here is that you get a lot of these people. Richard Marks you know, wrote a song with Ringo, which I thought was phenomenal. Going back a few albums, he was on Ringo's album. You, you got Gary Burr working with him, well, from all the, the, the albums with the Roundheads, too. But uh, so many of these people, Edgar Winter, you know, Todd Rundgren is, uh, has written a song with Ringo that's going to be on the next album. So, you know, it does eventually happen that these very same people, some of them get to work on Ringo's studio albums, but it doesn't mean you'll get the entire all-star band together as one sure. unit, which mm-hmm. would be a, a really nice, a nice concept. It would kind of be almost... Uh, Wilbury esque. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, well, except that, except that it would be going against the mission statement, yeah. if you will, of the I mean, All Star Band, which is the as as Tom mentioned on the last show, is you know the the songs we you know know and love. Mm. What tends to happen also in the McCartney shows has been that you know when he begins 
doing new songs, immediately the place empties for the beer lines. You know, it's just a, a fact of life of these kinds of shows, of shows of the quote unquote veteran artists, you know, heritage artists, if you will, is that most of the people that are there, they're not there to hear new music. They're mm -hmm. there to hear the songs they know and love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alan, well, are, we're uh, talking about, you know, an artistic uh, thing that we'd like to see happen oh, sure. with Ringo in the studio. That's all that we're mm -hmm. talking about here. And, you know, in, I mean, in, in every... Sorry, Again. alternatively, um, I, I've enjoyed the couple of shows I've seen him do with the Roundheads. And, you know, the Roundheads are not packed with stars in quite the same way, but those shows were great. And um, I would have loved to have seen him tour with those. I realize that's a dead letter at this point, but... Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, one thing I noticed about the about the current group is how relaxed they sounded as opposed to the last time I saw them. They've really yeah. that playing together has really has really developed a familiarity among the band to where they sound they're a lot more comfortable with each other now than they were, you know, when they first started out. It really shows, you know, with the extended jams and everything like that. But they all kind of know what each other is doing. They're and and I think, uh, you know, that's one thing that I don't know if it was uh, something Ringo expected or not, but it's really made the, uh, uh, you know, really developed the, all, the whole all-star band concept even further than maybe he, you know, initially intended or, you know, expected. And I, I think that's that's really good as far as that, as far as that group goes. It would be interesting to see, and I, and I agree that I wish Mark Rivera had been on there. Because that album was fantastic, and I think oh, I it would have been it would have been mm -hmm. great to have Mark Rivera there. But even so, I mean, they they sounded really good. They and Ringo looks very happy with the whole thing, you know. Well, depending yeah, on Billy Joel's schedule, he can always return anyway, and then maybe he can work a song from that album into the show. Yeah. Right. Well, what was kind of nice is at the Beacon. I'm not sure which night you were there, Alan. I went on the second night, um, and Mark you know, I guess was in town because Billy was playing that weekend or something uh, in New York. So he was New York based and uh, got up there and played with the band. They broke out one extra song and he played uh, Oye Como Va with them, which was really, uh, really great. Hmm. That wasn't the hmm. night I went. That's too bad. Oh, you went the night with great. the broken air conditioner, huh? <laughs> uh, hmm. hmm. I don't remember that, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure which night I went. I think I went the first night. Yeah. But uh, for me, I just think, and I've said this many times uh, on the show with Steve, the, the joy of seeing Ringo and the All-Stars is the combination of hearing him do his own songs, and yes, you're going to hear the Beatles songs, some of his solo hits, and usually a song or one or two songs that are new. But at the same time, you also get to see him drum behind artists and their songs that you wouldn't oh, yeah. get to see in any other circumstance. Yeah. No, so, that's, you know. It's awesome. Where else are you going to get to see Ringo drum behind Evil Ways <laughs> or right. uh, Rosanna or, or any of Todd's songs, you know, or, or Mr. and Mr. songs? And you can go back to all the All-Star Band tours and say that. Here he is drumming behind Greg Lake in the Court of the Crimson King. Where else are you going to hear something like that? It's just an amazing thing to observe and to also see how much he really loves doing this. He gets the best of both worlds. He well, can be behind the, the kit and he can be up front. You know, I think initially when they started out, it was more of a, um, you know, showing off the, you know, showing off the old guys concept like like uh, I think, Tom, you mentioned. But I think now it's, it's really developed into more of a, a musical thing where it's not so much showing off the old guys. It's, it's actually doing what ringo had intended all along is that they are actually playing as a unit and they are you know it's it, it, they're not uh it, it's not a uh you know how many member band or separate guys it's not everybody you know playing for a minute or you know a couple minutes and doing a song it's actually kind of gelling all together and i think that's really that's really a, a, a nice improvement uh you know, that probably nobody, you know, that really has, I, I don't know if anybody really expected that when, when they first started the whole thing out. Because basically it was like a circus act when they first started, and it's definitely more than that now. And there's also a humility with Ringo, a guy like Ringo, a Beatle doing this, you know, and that's, that's really cool too. 
So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I'd agree with your comments there about it being a circus act. I think all the bands have gelled through the years. I just think that when there's a band that's been together for three years and they keep doing this, they're going to be even stronger as a unit. And I think it really showed this past year. Like like we said, Steve, the solos were longer. Mm-hmm. There was a lot more jamming, especially on the Santana songs and the Toto songs. So, uh, yeah, I can see why you would think that this was more of a band, but I think they've all been great bands. Well, I think the circus act thing was was truer earlier on, you know, when they were just starting out and they and they really didn't, you know, and and you know, face it, at the beginning, they weren't sure this thing was going to go on. I mean, they they, I mean, it was popular from the beginning, sure, but I don't think they expected the enduring, you know, the enduring thing to happen. I, I really don't. And uh, now that it has, and now that it's, it has endured. You know, it's it's definitely took on, uh, you know, a, a kind of a life. Uh, not, I wouldn't say a life of its own, but uh, you know, a, it, it's had some uh, effects that they probably didn't think would happen initially. Yeah. And just the mere fact that it's been twenty five years. There you go. Yeah. Is. I mean, th- I mean, yeah. Think of it. I mean, there's always <laughs> there's always these kind of you know. I mean, there's all sorts of. You know, old, I mean, look at the uh, Flo and Eddie thing, the Flo and Eddie show, which is kind of the, uh, not not completely the same thing, but they use the same backup bands and, you know, and everything like that, you know, for all the acts. Um, you know, the Monkees have done it t- in the past with not only, you know, when they've played, but they, uh, when I saw them, uh, I can't remember now which year, but there was... Um, the um, grassroots and and um, Gary um, Gary that? Puckett Gary Puckett yeah and I mean they they use the you know a lot of the same musicians and th- that's kind of you know where the whole All Star Band thing kind of came from but it's really gone beyond that and that's you know you have to give obviously Ringo a lot of credit for that so mm. all mm. right so let's move on here anything else you want to add about Ringo. Well, he's got the, the, new album, the new album. Oh, yeah. Well, he is work. He just announced, by the way, that uh, he finished his new album, which will come out next year. So, uh, And we do know Steve Lukather is on it and Todd Rundgren, Richard Page, I believe, is on it. Yeah, Richard Marks, I've heard, is on it. So mm-hmm. some of the people from past all-star bands and the most recent will be on the new album. So, uh, yeah, uh, I always look forward to a new uh, Ringo album. And he's been putting out solid albums, especially since Time Takes Time. And I've been so pleased with the work that he's done studio album-wise. I think Time Takes Time was a real game changer in his career because it was such a strong, solid album, track by track. And I think ever since then, he's put a lot of effort behind the studio albums. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, a couple other you know, little nuggets from, from Ringo World this year. There was this... And there were a lot of tributes. Obviously, you know, 50 years drew a lot to the group, as we talked about last year, uh, last week, rather. But there were individual tributes to each Beatle, and it was kind of interesting seeing Ringo get his own on that uh, David Lynch Foundation Lifetime of Peace and Love show. Mm-hmm. He got some mm-hmm. Lifetime Award, and people came out, Betty LeVette and Joe Walsh and, you know, all these people, and they're doing, you know, back off Boogaloo and Photograph, and it don't come easy. But uh, what... I couldn't believe what I was watching. You know, the first band that came on, I, I, I think they're called Arc Life, uh, came out and did a song from the 2012 album. They did Can't Do It Wrong, a real nice bluesy version of that. I said, wow, this, this could really be fun, um, watching mm. you know, watching people go a little deep into the Ringo catalog. So that was fun. And uh, he did get one track out this year, guys. Do you remember it? He, he tackled the theme song to the Powerpuff Girl. Ah, oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so we, so we got that this year. That that was our that was uh, the addition to the Ringo uh, Canon this year. So, but uh, you know, the, obviously it ended on a very very high note. You know, with the Hall of Fame induction, and certainly started the year very strong with uh, a lot of the Beatles celebrations and uh, hooking up with Paul at the Grammy salute, et cetera. So, uh, good year end to end for uh, for our favorite drummer. Okay, how about we move on and talk about uh, George next? I was going to say, we could we cover John the... pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Mm, that's true. Very quickly. Very. All right. Well, we could. You want to do John? If, you know. Actually, yeah, actually, we'll... John would be quick to do because there wasn't very much. But there were. I should 
point out the um uh, HD tracks of um mm. all all of the albums um and also in Japan a set uh came out with the sort of little album cover up replicas um and the HD tracks you know I don't know if if people collect these or know that much about them, but they're um, at a, a very high sampling rate. Um, I cannot personally say that they sound immensely better than um, a really well-mastered uh, set like the, the 2010 set that came out on CD. But, um, but, you know, it is for, for people who are into extremely high fidelity uh, this is probably the way to go. Um, you're getting more density of information in the tracks, and in any case, than you are in a CD. So um, it, it's it's just at least worth noting that they're out there, the HD tracks versions of right. all the Lennon material. Flack, mm-hmm. Flack is always a great improvement. Yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever heard a Flack track that isn't better than MP3 mm. because of the you know the compression is just terrible, and on the MP3s, whereas you don't have that problem with the with the flat tracks, so yeah, that's a that uh, I I haven't heard those myself, but the, I, I can imagine they'd be probably pretty good. No, there was yeah, one they're huge. Other- I mean, an album is over a gig of of material, mm-hmm. uh, so it's you know, and they come as uh, as uncompressed waves at like you know forty eight ninety six sampling rates and wow, so yeah, they take a lot of space, but uh, they do sound good. Got to say. Okay. Hmm. There was one other I, I, nugget this year. Uh, it was Mrs. Lennon. She uh, she topped the Billboard dance charts for the 12th time this year. Mm-hmm. For, for those who, who are keeping score of such things, uh been a lot of remixes of some of her early Apple tracks and even some of her later Double Fantasy stuff. And I think uh, the winner this time, uh, just a couple months ago, was a a remix version of I'm Your Angel from Double Fantasy. Mm-hmm. So that was her, her 12th number one on the dance charts. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. She's had this whole other life. Oh, she you has. Know, and and uh, her own following in, in that world. So, Oh, you bet. You know. And, you know, they're, yeah. they're out there on iTunes, but they're a little hard to find because if you search under Yoko or Yoko Ono, they don't come up. They only come up if you just type in Ono. Right. It's odd. Yeah. <laughs> I happen to but pick it. There. I happened to pick up a CD, believe it or not, in a thrift store, and uh, it's it's definitely interesting. I prefer her, you know, the solo stuff that she that with her name on it rather than the uh, the Ono dance tracks. Uh, I think, but um, but yeah, it's I mean, it's it's definitely interesting. She she said a couple of years ago they she they were going to put out uh, remasters on the Apple albums, and uh, I'd really love to see those. Really would. Uh, yeah, they were done the one time, right by Ryko, but that that's got to be twenty years ago, mm-hmm. at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They did a nice job with them with bonus cuts and all the B sides of the singles and stuff, which was really kind of the draw. There, you got all of those uh, "Who Has Seen the Wind" and "Remember Love" and all of those songs uh, back on CD, and that was that was the place to get them was on the the Ryko reissues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was that. Um, I think it was six CDs box set Ono box. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really, is pretty much everything that you needed up up to that point. Yeah. And um, how do you guys feel about Yoko having this whole other life in this particular format? Do you think that her music works really well in a dance format? Did you ever perceive her music to be envisioned that way? I think oh, I think for- you, I think you have to take it for what it is. I mean. I think it works. Her music, I mean, even John, you know, was touting her music and, and touting the, you know, the the artistic quality that, and and she has, I mean, she can appeal to different people. I think it's great that she's able to do that with the dance stuff. I really do. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, there, I, there's, there's, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, um, her regular albums like Rising and stuff like that, that, you know, uh, for what they are, but... Yeah, I think it's great that she that she can do that and that she she still wants to do that and that people actually like that. I think that's that it it just says a lot. I certainly give her credit for the success she's had at that age, particularly uh just that it's in a form of a musical form that I don't personally like. I'm not mm. I'm just mm. not a fan. Of, I'm just not a fan of dance music of 
<laughs> you know, I don't like EDM. I don't like house. I don't like trance. Disco yeah. sucks. Yeah. Et cetera. <laughs> Yeah, I say it, it started with you know her first real entree into that, which was a track that drew a lot of attention for a lot of reasons, which was Walking on Thin Ice, mm -hmm. um, and you know even even the original version you know got a lot of play in clubs and things, and and again part of it was you know circumstance, and but guess what you know it was also that was also a really good record, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it kind of opened people's eyes up, um, so that was kind of neat. Um, it's kind of weird when you hear, you know, an EDM mix of something that is as, let's say, quaint in its original form as I'm Your Angel. Yes. And when, when, they're, when they're doing this to, to tracks like um, Moving On or, you know, one of her early Apple things, I know you move on fast or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I get it a lot better. This this last one was kind of weird, um, you know, yes. that they did it with uh, with I'm Your Angel. Um, so that that was kind of kind of interesting, but along the way there was one original in there that had never you know it wasn't a remix because John was on it. It was a, a new song she wrote, I think it was called Hold Me. Um, that was that was kind of interesting that 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 one uh, hit the the top two because it was it was you know it was a fresh track. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, yeah. Do you think part of the appeal is the fact that um, she has this identity that's not being the wife of John Lennon? that it's just her music, and she's going out as Ono and not Yoko Ono? Do you think that has anything to do with it, that it's like a, a whole other world now for her, I presenting so. the music Be this way? Yeah, because especially that audience, they don't really you know, have any kind of emotional investment in her being mm -hmm. John Lennon's wife. She's just yeah, a, right. you know, a dance music artist. Oh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think she can. I, I, I disagree, Al. I, I don't think she can lose that. I think, well, no, but I'm talking about the the dance music audience. They don't really, they don't care about, you know, they couldn't care less about her being John Lennon's wife because, you know, they're, you know, they they don't remember the day before yesterday. So, you know, all they all they all they care about is what's on the uh, what's currently hot, and if you know that kind of a that kind of a record appeals to them, fine. Yeah, no, see, I, 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 I still, I still think that the, her identity is part of the reason that they like her. You know, I mean, why? The, because I mean, they don't, you know, they don't have any, you know, the dance music audience doesn't have any, you know, emotional ties to the Beatles or to John Lennon or anything. You know, you know, it's just uh, she, she's a dance music artist. Well, she, I, I think it's more, maybe it's more the art thing. Than anything else, you know. I mean, the way she's mm -hmm. the way she's always been expanding the the boundaries of you know art as far as her you know what she does, and uh, yeah. I think that might be that okay. might that might be a little bit of it. Uh, yeah. But I think okay. there I think there is a little bit of a, of the Yoko identity sitting in there somewhere. Maybe you know. I think you you have a good. I point think though. the Yoko identity, yeah, but not the Yoko John the John and Yoko identity i don't think that has anything to do with the success of these records well i don't i i, th I you know you have to want i mean would would uh, would they be working with that if john lennon had never come into her life i don't think so i think that's i think would, she might not have never she might have never even gotten into music at all well that's true too. well she was doing avant-garde stuff with uh, with, with yeah. other people and and some of those pieces actually occasionally turn up in in um classical new music concerts oddly mm -hmm. enough um so actually for for uh, my usual sort of uh, McQuirky uh, point of view on this is if she never had gotten together with John, um, she might be still doing avant-garde music instead of dance music. And that in terms of, you know, just the just sort of, you know, actual absolute value in the world would be a great improvement. Mm. <laughs> and actually, actually, before she even did the, I think before she did the avant-garde, she was an actress. There's that uh, B movie she did that uh, you uh, that you can hunt Satan's around. Satan's bed. There you yes. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which was pretty awful. Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. 
But you know, I mean, All she right, was well, trained as a as a pianist. Her parents wanted her to be a classical pianist, so that that was her early musical training. And mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so, who knows where she would have gone if if she had uh, if she hadn't met John? But um, possibly not making dance music. And there's something to be yeah. said for that. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. She was already a big name in the avant-garde world. If she hadn't met mm. John, she might have been even bigger in the avant-garde world mm. and really have carved out it's... a bigger name for herself mm. in that I field. I think that's very possible. So, it's very possible. Yeah. You know, that show that she did where John met her, that, that was not just some nothing little show. Mm. That, was a, you know, that was a pretty significant event. And she had had some of them in New York as well. I mean, there's a there's a film of cut piece from 1965 um, filmed by the Maisel's brothers. So, uh, yeah, she she might very well have made some headway in in a different field. You know, for people who want, who like writing uh, alternative history novels, uh, this is a very yes. rich field to look into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. I uh, when I uh, when she did that lecture at Stanford uh, a few years ago. I was there, and she did cut piece that night, and it was amazing to see that in person. I mean, it was just, it was a mind blower. It really was. I mean, you can read all about it, but to actually see her do that is is wild. I mean, it's it's astounding. But anyway, not to get too far off the subject. Yeah, the only other thing I wanted to bring up about John was that I remember reading in one of your columns, Steve, that uh, there were plans that Yoko had for putting out a book of John's illustrations that had some unreleased stuff in there. And that actually didn't happen this year. So I'm thinking she's very anniversary driven Mm. these days. So uh, next year being what what will be 75 for his birthday, Mm. I'm thinking that will come out as well as finally uh, a remastered uh, not only CD, but DVD of the one-to-one concert mm-hmm. or concerts i don't know hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> mm. yeah it's unbelievable that it's five years ago that box set came out i mean that was for his 70th obviously mm-hmm. uh, right I don't know the, the time's going but you bring up a good point uh, about being anniversary driven uh 75 is kind of a big number so uh mm. that that'll be an interesting one to watch mm-hmm. yeah okay we move on to george and of course the big yeah. news the biggest news really was the Apple Years box set that came out this year. Who wants to tackle that first? Well, you know, I, I've been recently listening. I went back to the Dark Horse set, and I actually think the Dark Horse set is better. I, You know, those albums are are, are so good in there. But, um, I mean, there's something to be said about the Apple Years box, too, because it's got uh, All Things Must Pass and stuff. But uh, I, think the, I think the Dark Horse set... Is a little better uh, overall, but my 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 thinking there. But it's, I'm glad I'm glad they finally put that out because you know it, that stuff deserved to be out. Yeah, there. I mean, there was there was some real you know pluses and minuses. I, I'm real torn on this set, Ken. I mean, mm-hmm. on the on the one side, does any album need remastering less than electronic sound? <laughs> uh, you know that, that. You know, look it. It had to be in there. If you're doing them all, it has to be in there. But um, somehow there was no real concession there. Wonder actually, one my probably my favorite in the in the set, like in terms of an improvement, was Wonderwall because that had never been remastered since it's. I guess it it was only ever pressed once on CD, even that and that's what early '90s, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, right, and I thought the sound quality, the sound quality yeah. on Wonderwall initially was great on yeah. CD. I thought it was really good. Yeah. Um, it sounds good here. I I like kind of you know that there are bonus cuts on that one, and you know at the end of the day it's kind of cool. You get a backing track to a Beatles song with no mm. Beatles, mm. <laughs> on right. which there are no Beatles. But uh, it was a beautiful piece of music. Always was. I mean, it was nothing revelatory to say. Oh wow, I didn't realize the music in this was that beautiful. It it always was. It always will be. You know, it was kind of tough to have to you know include. Living in a material world, it was you know fairly recently remastered. Uh, I guess what about oh six or so? Um, so that yeah. you know kind of seemed like mm, again uh, and again losing track of the years. I said, oh, we just got a remaster of All Things Must Pass until Al uh, reminded me that that was fourteen years ago. So that was <laughs> kind of nice to to get. Obviously, as a as a collector, the thing I was looking most forward to was 
the the final two studio albums proper, the pop albums of Dark Horse and um, and Extra Texture, because those have never been remastered. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so having those was nice. I guess that my biggest disappointment with it was the lack of any, you know, or event to any degree, any new undiscovered or previously unreleased outtakes, alternates. There was a, a real smattering, but I mean, working backwards, you look at Dark or I'm sorry, Extra Texture. There's one bonus cut. It's the you know, it's the uh, the 1990s remake of this guitar. Nice to have. Um, it's been in circulation. But you, are, is there nothing from that session that I mean? I I know there are outtakes of you, um, which by the way go back mm-hmm. to all things must pass. But you know there are some you know alternate versions and things that have been out on that. Within Dark Horse, we got a couple. We got that nice alternate version of the title track, which was kind of nice. But you know left it wide open would have been a great place to have included you know some of the live tracks from that tour. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Plus, a, plus a lot of people, I think, were expecting uh, there to be a DVD of some kind in the box, and they were they were really expecting uh, at least some material, if not an entire concert from the 1974 tour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Since obviously that uh, you know coincides with uh, you know the the, you know, the, the chronology yeah. there. Right. right. But, uh, but there was there was nothing. Yeah, what it would have been nice, you know, because it was kind of interesting. I know, Steve, you um, you report frequently on the Wolfgang's Vault uh, series. Mm-hmm. It was a, a show, I believe, from the L.A. Forum that was on Wolfgang's Vault, which was right. you know, recorded really well. I, I think on Wolfgang's, it ran just about 70 minutes. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it didn't have all the guest stuff. It didn't have the Ravi Shankar and the other guys. But it had the George stuff, and it was really good. And that would have made a nice, you know, a nice... Uh, bonus disc to have so you know the bonus material yeah, yeah it was nice that they rounded out and you got um i don't care anymore in bangladesh um finally the on, b sides yeah, yeah on well even the a side for bangladesh because mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. the remastered version of that was a, a download a, a few years back for an anniversary mm-hmm. so it was it, you know it, it tidied up uh, you know in the plus column it tidied up a bunch of loose ends um in the minus column there was a bunch of stuff that uh, you know, given the choice, you might not have said, you know, yeah, that adds value and should raise the price. But what was kind of weird um, was the omission of Bangladesh, the the concert album. And mm-hmm. what's kind of weird, I know it's multi-artist, but I mean, let's face it, anytime you went to find that record in a store, you looked under George Harrison. It's his show. Yeah, it was just released a few years ago. What could have uh-huh. been done is, at least in the box, put a slot for it and then you know before anyone cries foul and says oh but then they're forcing you to go get it pop quiz who's buying this box that doesn't own the concert <laughs> exactly mm-hmm. could it be because so, it was a could it be because it was a charity album i don't know if they're still yeah, paying that's for, to unicef but maybe they wanted yeah. to keep it separately for that accounting well or? again they that's wouldn't have included in there but they could have left a slot for it yeah yeah that would have been a great box. idea Again, because no one, I, I can't imagine anyone who was going to plunk down whatever this this box cost. I don't even remember. Uh, uh, hundred, probably a hundred yeah. bucks. Mm-hmm. What? Who likes George Harrison enough to spend a hundred bucks on a box and doesn't own the Bangladesh record? Right. Mm-hmm. Probably, right. probably nobody. So it, I don't think they would have been quote. Yeah, you know, and you guys can see this because I'm on this guy. Forcing with the little air quotes here, mm-hmm. forcing you to buy anything. <laughs> right. But uh, it would have it would have made a nice. Uh, Nice little thing to you know to to put the extra the extra disc in. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. that's that's kind of neat. Um, you know, it's nice that it sits side by side with the Dark Horse box. Um, we have pretty much everything there. You get those two and the Wilburys. Um, you know, what's left is truly the uh, the miscellaneous. Um, you know, of guest appearances and and charity records and things like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Alan. How about you? How did you feel about the box set? Well, pretty much the same way. I mean, I thought the remastering was nice. I don't know that there was a great improvement over, on the two recent ones, uh, All Things Must Pass, recent, not 2001, 
or uh, living in the material world. And in fact, I'm not entirely sure they were really remastered. I, I scoured the literature for any indication that they had been redone, and it it, it really wasn't clear. Um, so they, those may be the same masters that are on the recently released remastered sets. I like Tom would have liked some more bonus tracks um but who knows maybe they're saving those for an archival release and want them all together rather than scattered this way I, I don't know but they did scatter a few so it's there's no real consistency but you know I think it was nicely done I think it's a nice companion to the uh the later box set that came out earlier and uh, other than, you know, I, I pretty much agree with Tom about most of it, so I, I don't have really much more to say. Looking forward mm. to some new, new unreleased Harrison, finally. You know, now that, they've, mm. now that they've got the reissues of all the commercially released albums out of their system, maybe we'll start seeing some other material, because I really believe there is some in the Harrison archives. Oh, well, I mean, the, the early Takes album, I mean, that came sure. out with- Video mm-hmm. that was wonderful. That, that was proof yeah. positive. Uh, and while you know that some of that was in collector circles uh, for several years, there was stuff on there that none of us, uh, even the most ardent collectors, uh, had ever heard or even heard of. Uh, so there, there's no question that there's stuff in that in the archive that uh, that is just ripe for the picking. Oh, there's. I mean, there's, right. there's been so much bootleg Harrison stuff. It's ridiculous. And yeah. for and they barely touched you know they I can't believe how little you know the Harrison Harrison estate is used it's it's really I don't know that's it's really a shame. Olivia goes on a BBC talk show to promote the thing, and she plays an unreleased song on it. Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't in the box. Yeah. Admittedly, yeah. it's it's you know it's out of period. It's from seventy I guess around seventy eight seventy nine. She wasn't even right. sure, but it was later seventies. But you know. Come on, how much is in there that that could be you know that could be dusted off? I'm sure there's plenty. Mm-hmm. You know, not to bring the conversation back to Yoko for a second uh, uh, section, but I have to say, <laughs> of of all of them, including the Beatles as a group, she probably is the best about getting archival stuff out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was the the mm-hmm. Lennon anthology was sure. you know, was that six discs or something, and uh, not to mention the lost Lennon tapes, which I was, was a say, trove exactly. of yes. material. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so it would just, be nice just to if, give her credit, if, right? <laughs> yeah. I- Absolutely, but it would be nice. There's so much stuff that was in that radio series that has not come out officially. Oh yeah, and it would be really, really nice if there was some kind of box set right there. There could easily be an anthology box too, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I, I also have to think that this is a business, no matter what. You have yes. to look at it that way, and. Exactly. You know, you got to stretch the soup as far as you can. And I don't think that you're ever going to see a time when Yoko's going to say, well, here's everything. Mm-hmm. Here's everything else that hasn't come out. Olivia's not going to say that either for George. And, you know, you wait a few years and there'll be a new release. I have no doubt. I mean, Giles Martin has said that he was asked to work on the next early takes. So mm-hmm. you know that that is in the works. So. You know, you just have to be patient every, you know, two, maybe three years for something to come out. And Danny, uh, it's Steve and I were talking about this. Danny had said in Rolling Stone that he's very conscious of uh, what his father would want. And and uh, George would not want to be scraping the bottom of the barrel and just putting out anything that's out there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those 10 tracks that were on Early Takes Volume 1 were, to me, just phenomenal, because George has a life all of his own just on acoustic guitar and nothing else. And it's just so wonderful to hear him alone with the, with the guitar, in most cases. And then you had all those little gems like Let It Be Me that we didn't even know about oh, yeah. <laughs> that existed. So, But getting back to the box set, yeah, I was kind of disappointed about the lack of extra material. But when you think about the best of Dark Horse, those CDs had one extra track <laughs> each yeah. with the exception mm-hmm. of uh of cloud nine which mm-hmm. had two i think and uh so we didn't have uh you know this this overwhelming amount of unreleased material from the best of dark horse either i think like alan said they're probably reserving that stuff for the early take series i would think but the only big disappointment as as um tom was just saying and and i said it in the show with steve 
if you're thinking about anniversaries at all, and who's to say whether they are, but this was the perfect mm. opportunity to do something for Dark Horse for the yes. tour. It's the 40th anniversary. Mm-hmm. So you not only have the CD coming out remastered for the first time, but why not have a companion to that? So, but the, the sound quality, and I kind of agree with you, Alan, about all things must pass and living in the material world, they're kind of similar to the remasters. I don't know if I really heard that much of an improvement. But I did hear a marked improvement to my ears with extra texture. I think that the original CD was very muddy sounding, and this one has is much more full. The dynamic range, I think, is much improved on extra texture. I don't know if I would say that necessarily about Dark Horse. I think there was a slight improvement on the Dark Horse album. But well, that's um, probably the, uh, the the most the the most positive thing about this box is that we now have relatively superior quality certainly superior quality uh versions of uh of dark horse and extra texture to the originals which came out what i think in the late 80s if i recall correctly mm-hmm. um, right. and weren't even fully uh, you know domestic releases and and the same with um uh with wonderwall music and electronic sound you know mm-hmm. you know you know albeit they're not you know, but really mainstream type releases, but still, um, very few people would have gotten them when they first came out on CD. So to at least have them for your collection is a positive. Oh yeah, no, and those those were pretty limited, uh, particularly the first two. I know it. Yes. You go to to the fest, or you can go on eBay, and you know, up until you know, you know the new ones came out, because now you can get the the new ones individually as well for whatever mm-hmm. fifteen bucks or something. Electronic sound, you know, was going for thirty five, forty, and fifty bucks. I'm, I'm going to boy, you you really got it. You really got to love your collection <laughs> to do. That. Yeah. yeah, I had bought them, you know, back in I'm, I'm I want to say early nineties when they came out. It might have been late eighties, Al. Um, when when Apple, I guess the Apple ones uh, came out uh, probably very early nineties, maybe ninety one, mm-hmm. and. You know, as a collector, as a, as a completist, as an archivist, whatever, um, you know, they were there. Uh, the Dark Horse and actually, the Dark Horse sounded as as you know a little bit uh, a little bit too uh, shrill, maybe in some places, as to where the extra texture was the exact opposite. It just sounded dull and mm. flat. But some of those songs sound sound pretty good this time around. It was not, I, you know, I certainly hadn't hauled those records out for a full sit down in quite a while, um, and they sounded better than I remembered them. That's for sure. Those last two. Mm-hmm. One thing about electronic sound, um, you know, it, it was it was a little controversial in that um, shortly after it was released, Bernie Krause, who. Uh, mm worked on it with George uh, basically said listen this is just me showing George how to use the synthesizer these aren't even real pieces and he was a little he was actually very upset about it and he was very upset about it for many years um, I, I mm. had a chat with him in the 80s and he was still upset about it um, mm. and to their credit in the notes for the booklet they go through the entire story and it's not really it's it's a little bit different than Bernie Krause told it um, and he's no longer with us um, but they do get into the controversial aspects and the dispute and the fact that his name was silvered over on the album. And uh, uh, I think the one difference is that they they say that he wanted his name silvered over on the album. And he uh, he tells it a little differently. He said, my name was originally going to be on the album, and they silvered it over, uh, uh, basically writing him out of the picture. Um, so there's a little bit of dispute still, but nevertheless, they, they didn't completely ignore it, and I think that was a good thing. It was kind of interesting. You know, Danny, you know, did a lot of the promotion on this first, you know, first person, uh, going on the Conan show and uh, doing some interviews and press for this. And hearing him tell the story, I said, oh, my God, this almost sounds like, you know, Dakota Days Part 2. You know, he's (laughs) telling the story of, you know, yeah, and by the way, you know, this is, you know, while George was alive, so it's many years ago. Oh, you know, Dad was playing this record, and I walked by the room, and I heard this, and I said, wow, what is that? It's fantastic, you know. There, there are certain things you, you know, you, you can believe with uh, less, uh, less fewer <laughs> grains of salt than others. 
Sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> he, he told that story. But it was kind of neat that he did get out in front of the release. Again, going on the Conan show, playing with uh, with the guys from Fab Faux and, and Jimmy Vivino and those guys and having all mm-hmm. those guests come on. It was some really, really cool performances uh, each yes. night. You know, mm-hmm. Laura Jones did a great um, mm. that locked door and you know, you got Paul Simon doing Here Comes the Sun. I mean it was it was pretty cool. And then I guess um Steve, you may know more about this. I'm not sure. Maybe you even went to the, the George Fest that went on out in California. No, I, I didn't. That was in LA. Um, uh, yeah, that was in LA. I didn't get to that. Yeah, I mean that you know, from all we've seen on whatever YouTube or news clips and stuff, it looked like a kind of cool night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One one thing, one more thing. Uh, they apparently got the um, the sides on electronic sound correct. They yeah. they uh, supposedly fixed that up uh, so that they had the correct uh, A and B sides on that album, uh, which they apparently didn't have on some of the pressings. So, and how could no one have noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> I, know. No have noticed that? I know. I know. I <laughs> know. That actually kind of answers its own question, right? <laughs> uh, as I said, that, that there are there are a few albums that um, I'm pretty sure I'm covered on. They don't need to remaster that one again for me. And Al will tell you, I, I collect pretty much anything. Okay, so, uh, okay. so uh, just not sure we need another one on that. Okay, but, uh, but not a bad year well, in the Harrison camp. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Not a bad. Well, you know, at, at some point, I'd love to have a discussion with you guys about the experimental avant-garde side of the Beatles because you listen to the interview that Olivia Harrison gave to Jules Holland, and that was a really wonderful show. Um, she's talking with a lot of pride about electronic sound, that George was kind of a forerunner in the movement for, for the Moog synthesi- synthesizer and, uh, and for synthesizer music by doing that. So, you know, there could be a healthy debate talking about that. Oh, and I, uh I, I don't know that I don't know but, that anybody's gonna gonna really seriously take uh you know that uh you know, take that seriously really. Um I mean the album wasn't it, it wasn't that astounding. I mean I've heard I've heard better electronic albums than that one, you know. So I don't know. No, but but uh, the, the mere fact that if you if you follow <laughs> if you follow what the Beatles did, especially with their own label with Apple, that really represented what the Beatles were all about. I mean, they took all different types of music, and they and they had artists on there like John Tavener, you know, they had Yoko, they had experimental stuff going on, and they were into it in their own way. John with Yoko with the early albums, and you either like it or appreciate it for what they were trying to do. Or you think that, you know, it was a joke, really, and nothing to be taken seriously. King of fuss. So, yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that, but now remember, Ken, when you, when you mentioned John Tavener, that's mm-hmm. Sir John Tavener to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sir John. Hey, well, the late, the late Sir John Tavener. That's yeah, right. Yes, he, this yeah. is true. Mm-hmm. That's true. That'll that be was, a great think, show, Ken, year. one day. We do all the Apple artists that they signed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. that is a good that is a good idea. Y- you look at that roster; that is an incredible label. It, it is. really is. Modern Jazz Quartet, Taverner's very first two recordings, uh, and he subsequently became quite big in classical circles. Mm. Um, you know, yeah, that's a it's a good idea. Yeah, he, yeah. And he then lined up, he lined up a few then you had, weeks down the road. You know, Princess Diana's funeral. He got to write the music for that. He, yeah, you know, it's a pretty choice <laughs> gig. You know. Yeah. <laughs> And and that Apple book that's coming out is going to have a lot more connected stuff to Apple that that people don't realize. That's that's going to be interesting too. So, and you know, if you take a look at the full roster of those Apple artists, you've also got the Radha Krishna Temple. You've oh, got yeah, a great right. R and B singer like Doris Troy. You know, mm-hmm. these are all extensions of what the Beatles were all about. Yeah, it was Shankar. their vision of what they wanted to. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. So Bad you know, think about what they were. What they were trying to do with their record company, although you know they didn't really have, uh, I guess, enough of a staff to promote promote well their music. But initially, mm. what their attempt was was to you know introduce so many different genres of music because that's that's what the Beatles were all about. They were the kings of eclectic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, so whether it's Alan's favorite album, Life with the Lions, or. Uh, <laughs> Which he likes to make fun of, or, or it's the Radha Krishna Temple, or Billy Preston, or Jackie Lomax, or Badfinger, or Mary Hopkin, more folky. Uh, you know, 
that's what the Beatles were all about. And Apple was really just a part of it all. It was their vision of it all. And I have so. to, I have to say, I really like that Rodney Christian Temple single. I love that. Oh, yeah, oh, Govinda mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. one of my favorite mm-hmm. Apple records. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have one Beatle left, and he's like an hour to himself. Who is that? <laughs> uh, yeah, which one? Which one have we forgotten? It's Jimmy Nickel. Oh, okay. You want to, you want to do it as a two-parter? <laughs> <laughs> That would make it a three-parter. <laughs> really? That'll work. That'll work. This, Plenty this to about. A, another way, another reason to haul Tom back. There you go. I, I have, what the hell else am I doing on Tuesday He'll night? never except, get away. Yeah, except <laughs> yakking about the Beatles, right? Well, yeah, we, we've gone, on, I guess, about an hour with this. But um, yeah. Yeah. You know, if you guys want to do McCartney as a separate show, I mean, obviously there's plenty. You yes. know, if we're going to go around the horn like we did tonight, there's, I mean, between the, I guess we got the, the two archives, we got a, pr- a pretty decent night at the Grammys, right? He comes home with five statues, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. candlestick, the, the, you know, the revamped version of the new, I imagine that's going to take a, a little bit of debate too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, keep going. You're the art of McCartney, you know, yeah. you're talking about that, right. that tribute record. I mean, that's, there's enough to talk about there, so yeah. Uh, in fact, he, just, just, he just put out a whole uh, a, a little thing today about uh, everything he's done this year. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, hope, there you hope go. For the future, we got to do that. Yeah. So plenty to talk about right there. So why don't we just reserve that for next time? All right. Before we go, I just wanted to bring up something, and it's kind of ironic. We were talking last week on the show about um, how Paul and Ringo. Uh, are very sensitive about this 50th anniversary thing and they don't want to have it mm. hammered into their heads and you know and I'm starting to really understand this whole concept of why they feel that way because it just so happens that a few days after we talked about that there was a radio station one of the radio stations that carries my show every little thing who was telling me that they're having a hard time getting sponsors for the show because the Beatles have a stigma of being too old so mm. I can certainly <clears throat> understand that every single time that you attach an anniversary, you're making that the reason, or a very big reason, to buy the music, you know, and unfortunately, we're living in a culture where so much of the way that the music is presented to us is how it's marketed, that this is a 60s song, or this is a 70s song, instead of whether or not it's a good song, (laughs) or not, or whether or not musically it fits the format, and so... I'm really understanding kind of what Paul and Ringo are thinking there. And when you go back and look at the most successful album of the past decade, as Al has reminded us many times, <laughs> right, the, Be- numerous times. The, Beatles, the Beatles won. They didn't say, hey, here's all the number one songs of the 60s with the Beatles. It was just their <laughs> number one songs. It's just the way that it's presented. So the way that you, you really present the music is really kind of important. If all that you keep hearing is, it was 50 years ago today, this then yeah. you're really making it feel like it's old, yeah. you know? And unfortunately, old does not sell. You know, I, I work in an industry where we used to have something called oldies radio stations. Yeah, They're not called oldie stations. They're called right. classic greatest, hit stations now. Greatest, or greatest hits. Yeah, classic hits. Yeah. But, you know, you use the word classic, or I like to use mm-hmm. timeless. But mm-hmm. uh, to me, if you present it that way, it's a better way to sell the music. So, you know, all this talk about Paul and Ringo in particular not wanting to sell it that way. And that could be their own approach and how any future releases go out. So, like I was saying in last week's show, this whole idea of the Beatles Live Project, which Ron Howard is working on now, and it's a collection of all the live stuff from the years. It's not being presented as a 50th anniversary thing. It's here's the best of the Beatles live performances or or you know, learning information about their their live performances as opposed to just being the anniversary. That shouldn't be the major selling tool behind what goes out. And mm-hmm. we can easily, I, I think we live far too much in an anniversary-driven culture that, uh, you know, I, I think that's a major drawback. And, and in this particular case, in relation to my radio show, you know, it, it, it hurts the sale. It, it, it makes it difficult to sell a, a Beatles show. For that reason, hmm. and so, uh, yeah, I, can, you know, I, I, 
I can kind of back up that with this, what I was mentioning last week about my book. The fact that once we got past March 1st, the saleability of it to as far as any kind of media interest went out the window. So it's very similar to what you're coming up against with uh, with every little thing. You know, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree because I think you know when you have music, classic music like the Beatles, like Elvis, I think the age thing only goes so far. And I think when you have really good music like that, it's gonna it's gonna get past that age thing. I don't really. I don't. Oh, oh, obviously, because again, the success of one proves that. Mm-hmm. But, but just that the 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 powers that be in radio or uh, in in various forms of media, they they don't think in those terms. They don't realize that young people are buying that music. They think the Beatles are this group from the sixties. You know that even those even those greatest hits radio stations like CBS FM in New York, their airplay of Beatles music has shrunk to basically just you know the Red and Blue albums mm-hmm. or or the or the One album, you know, hmm. they, and they don't go any further than that. I don't know. I don't know how you well, how how submerging the fifty fifty year thing is going to change that. I really I I really can't see that. Alan? Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, I understand the argument, but nevertheless, people can count and people know when it is. And to, and to, to submerge this or, or keep it under wraps or simply define it in a different way for marketing reasons is basically to kowtow to the deficiencies of our culture as it's currently constituted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this music is the zenith of Western Civ, and that's all there is to it. And um, <laughs> right. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for these programmers and marketers. I mean, to me, these are simply, you know, basically the lowest form of life in the cultural world. <laughs> in, you know, yeah. indeed, they they ruin everything, and they ruin everything mm-hmm. because they have a theory about what will sell and what's what won't sell. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. As Al points out, and 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 others view the, the the reality out there is that people of all kinds of ages love this music mm-hmm. um, because it's great music. It doesn't matter when it's from. And I mean, I suppose this is an argument that I'm used to from my classical music side. You know, that Indeed. stuff's hundreds of years old. You know, and it it. Faces some of the same problems. I mean, they don't have to say fifty years. Fifty years. This is pretty new for some of that stuff. But um, the the idea that you know, in, in classical radio, there was uh, there was something like this too in the eighties. Uh, they they tried to make everything sort of hip and up to date without playing real new music. I mean, the, the funny thing is that they wanted it to be hip and up to date. But they found contemporary classical music so scary that they wouldn't play it. Uh, it was kind of a, you know, and, and so for me, the marketers in pop radio and the marketers in classical radio are basically the same people. And uh, yeah. it's uh, it's just shocking. And, you know, it's it's. I'm sorry to hear that that's the case, Ken, with your show. Um, But basically, we need a revolution. (laughs) Well, absolutely. Based based on what you just said, Alan, I think that you're the guy to sell my show now at a radio station. (laughs) (laughs) No, really. I mean, I've been saying for the longest time this industry is more about marketing now than it is about music. And I'm not going to say that Mm -hmm. that today's music is all awful, as a lot of people in my age bracket will say, because there's a lot of great music out there but Mm -hmm. um it's just a matter of whether or not you want to invest the time and try to find it which is far more time consuming than it used to be in the old old days when you only had a few radio stations to pick from but Mm -hmm. um yeah but really it's more about marketing than ever before but the point that i'm trying to say here is that if you're trying to get a sponsor for a show and they think that way and they think the beatles equals old in their minds it's very hard to convince people to think otherwise. And a lot of that is all, you know, the brainwashing of our culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, true. I, I, you know, I, I keep thinking back to the um, uh, what the story that jo- Giles Martin told when he was doing the, uh, the Love album. And he would have Ringo and, and Paul in to listen to some of his 
you know, mashups and remixings of, of tracks. And they wanted him to go further to make, basically to make the music sound, you know, that much newer. So that mm. may have something to do with, with their feelings on that, you know, which, uh, which is interesting when you consider that two thirds of Paul's on stage, you know, on his current uh, set list, about two thirds of it is, is Beatles music. Mm-hmm. Well, yep, that's another conversation we have to have. Yes. But anyway, that pretty much uh, brings the show to a close. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us here. And uh, if any of you would like to write to us here at the program, we do have an email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch with me, that's Ken Michaels directly, you can write to my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. And please look at my website, too, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And um, anybody else want to plug anything before we go? Uh, the new issue of Beetle Fan is, oh, uh, yeah. hot, is hot off the presses with, uh, I think, contributions from Tom and, well, certainly with, from, from Tom and myself. And I believe Alan has something in there, don't you? I don't think so. I'm going to do okay. something for this new series Bill has, but um, I haven't done it yet. So. Okay. <laughs> And Ken, just one thing to add about that, you know, the, that anniversary angle. Yeah. It, it's feeling young is what keeps you young. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> we, had, we, had to get, we had to get Brother Ralph in there somewhere. There we go. It's feeling young. I, mu- I, must, I must let all of our listeners know that with Tom in the show, there will always be a Honeymooners reference. Oh, wow. Sometimes it may not be as obvious, yeah. but some of us will get it. Okay. Somebody needs to do a book on the wit and wisdom of Ralph Crampton. Oh, not me. I, 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 I'd be all over it. All Tom would be over. ideal. <laughs> all That'll, over. There we go. All right, so so Tom, it's been great having you again, and we'll have you back. We should say, call me back again. There you to go. The show for, uh, for oh. uh, part three. For part three of the uh, of the year interview. We'll see if Tom can stretch this into part four. Yeah, there we go. We'll and, talk uh, about it. We'll, we'll get into each individual track on Speed of Sound. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> or, or better yet, Ken, you know, the, the after we maybe we talk about the archive stuff at the end, you know, save that for the end of the McCartney show and bridge it into what will be in the next archive release as the very best album that any of the four of them ever made. <laughs> uh oh. You said that you said that in our last said, show. Yeah. So I mean that well, I, we should definitely have a debate over that. Mm-hmm. I mean I'm, that's the fun thing, especially for all of us who love to talk to fellow Beatle fans. And I look on Facebook and and see everybody's opinions about what their favorite McCartney album is. And mm. there's a ton of Ram fans out there. I'll tell you that. Yeah, certainly are. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it is fun to talk about that and and uh, talk about McCartney through the years and what you think are his best albums or his best songs or his best period and Everyone's got a different opinion. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Tom, thanks again for being here on the show. It's great having you. We'll have you back next week. And uh, fourth, I'm looking forward to it. And four things we said today. This is Ken Michaels thanking everyone for listening and thanking Steve Marinucci and Al Sussman and Alan Cozen for joining us. And we will see you all next time. In fact, we'll see you all same time next year.